With us today is a wonderful Alexa Tarantino, who is an award-winning saxophonist, woodwind doubler, composer, and educator. She's performed regularly as a leader and sidewoman in a variety of ensembles and genres, including the Cecile McLaurin Salvant Quintet, her C Cecile McLaurin Salvant Ogress Ensemble, Ulysses Owen Jr.'s Generation Y, LSAT with Arturo O'Farro, the D Diva Jazz Orchestra, and her own quartet. She's an artist on the Positone record label. Her debut quartet re record on Positone, Winds of Change, was released late May of 2019, followed by Clarity in June of this year. Alexa is currently on faculty for Jazz at Lincoln Center's youth programs and represents the organization as a clinician and educator for various schools, festivals, and workshops. She holds a master's degree in jazz studies from the Juilliard School and bachelor's degrees in saxophone performance and music education from the Eastman School of Music. So welcome, Alexa. It's so wonderful to have you. Thanks, Andy. It's great to be back with you all at Jazz St. Louis. Thank you. And with us as well today and, and in most of our live streams is my colleague, uh, another wonderful saxophonist, uh, Carlos Brown Jr. Hey, hey. <laughs> So today we're going to talk a little bit about um, building harmonic vocabulary, um, which is a, you know, we've talked, touched on this in some other live streams, but, you know, we wanted to get uh, an opinion from world-class musician like Alexa. So um, just start out, I know part of learning a tune or learning and working with harmonic material is first understanding a tune and learning a tune. So could you maybe talk a little bit about your process for that? Absolutely, yeah, thanks Andy. So one thing that I love to kind of demonstrate is, is my approach to learning a tune because I feel like students, um, you know, when you're at that age where you're trying to understand jazz repertoire and you're trying to internalize standards and common chord progressions, you kind of look at your teachers and your mentors and they already know all of this and it's, it's not really talked about. I think, you know, oftentimes when someone asks the question, how do you learn tunes? The answer is by playing them over and over and over and over. And that's true to an extent, but um, I think you could be, you could play a tune over and over and over and over and still, you know, maybe not be absorbing some of the major elements that you need to absorb. So for me, um, you know, and I think for a lot of us that, that probably teach this way, the main elements are of course the melody and then the bass line and then the harmony. So those are the three elements that you're working with in any given tune. And of course, you know, there might be a particular groove that you're working with, a particular style, you know, maybe this is sort of like an early jazz tune or more of a modern jazz tune. That's all important to take into consideration. But for our purposes, you know, I really kind of think about melody, harmony, bass line. And so what I try to do first is learn the melody by ear as much as possible. Just listen to that melody over and over, like walking to school, walking to work, you know, so much so that if I knocked on your door at 4 a.m. and I said, you know, Sally, sing me the, the Head to Killer Joe, you know, you could just like rip it out, right? Right then, right then and there um, in your subconscious almost. And then the same goes for the bass line. And this is where I feel a lot of people kind of overlook the importance of the root movement. So there've been so many times when I've gotten on a jam session and somebody will say like, okay, let's play Siora. And maybe I haven't played Siora in like five years, but I know the melody because I'm kind of a melody person. I'm a horn player, you know, I can pretty much remember the melodies, but chord changes, I don't always remember. Um, and for me, the saving grace is when I hear the bass player playing behind us during the melody, it starts to come back to me because a lot of these chord progressions that we're working with are very repetitive. They're very common. Um, and so really getting those into your head by just playing and emphasizing the roots is so important. Um, so like for an example, you know, just even on a blues, something that I'll, when I was first learning blueses or working on blues in all 12 keys, I might just go through and improvise using only the roots. So I call this roots and rhythms. Okay, so I'm I'm outlining a, a concert B flat blues here. 
with some of the standard sort of uh, intermediate bebop chord changes there. I, I addressed the one chord, four chord, one chord, one chord, four chord, sharp four diminished, one chord, six chord, dominant, and then two, five, one. So D6, two, five, back to the top, just for anybody who is curious there. Um, and so that alone is a really great step. And having that down, even just in all 12 keys, if you're working on understanding the blues progression and difficult keys, or perhaps you're trying to work on more advanced blues progressions, you know, maybe you're not used to playing the sharp four diminished card, maybe, maybe you're working on addressing that six chord there, or maybe you're working on clarifying your two five ones, um, even just getting that understanding of the, the bass movement is really, really, really important. Um, and then from there, I'll try to act like a bassist. Um, and I don't know about you guys, like Carlos or Andy, I think we, we you know we chatted about this a little bit. And I'd love to get your, your thoughts on it. But for me, um, acting like a bassist is how I basically demonstrate that I understand the changes. So if I'm just playing solos, <laughs> You know, that's all well and good, but to get there, I really have to have an understanding that the chords underneath that are. like kind of an advanced baseline. Do you guys, um, Andy or Carlos, have any thoughts on, on baseline stuff? For sure. Uh, you know, as you know, we, we were discussing just a yeah. little bit about, uh, you know, baselines and, and thinking like a bassist. Uh, the first, as a matter of fact, let me go back. Cause I, I know I said, I, I said, I didn't realize how important it was until I got to <laughs> which is Very true, which is very true. But when I was in high school and this was so funny, um, we were at Essentially Ellington. I can't say the year. I refuse to say the year because I think I have some students watching, so I'm not going to say anything. But <laughs> but uh, it was my good friend. Uh, I don't know if, if he if he's watching or if he'll ever see this, but huge shout out to Marcus Howe from uh, Fort, Lauder Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, man, we were, uh, all of us were just kind of like at this saxophone master class. And so I noticed that like, the cool cats were just like hanging after the master class. Like everybody else was just like leave, you know, all right, all right, let's go to the next thing. But then there was just like maybe three or four cats hanging. And so uh, he introduced me to the West Daddy warm up. And so like what he, it, it's basically, it's the same thing, but you're just walking the baseline and then, you know, so let's just say if, if it's, it's me, it's me and you Alexa or me and Andy, I, we'll start off with maybe B flat, you know, and then we'll, we'll trade off. So we'll take a course of piece. So I'll play, I'll play a, course of a, a solo and then I'll switch off and walk a bass line for Marcus or you or, uh, or Andy and then we'll go up a half step or we'll go up you know a fourth or we'll go up and so I, I say all that to say you know that's it, it's very refreshing to hear that other horn players are thinking like this and then I know a, a while ago we had uh, awesome bassist Bob DeBoo from St. Louis uh, join us on here and he was just talking about destination. And that and that that was a very important word that I again like one of my one of my professors he said he stopped and he said why are you playing like chord change chord change chord change he said just he said it, it, it's not a bad thing he said but he said you kind of want to think of destinations and then that word just kept coming up over time over time and and I think by walking bass lines I I think it really shows you like or it allows you to see like the destination versus just like okay like this is just a I don't know if we're playing a person, this is just a D minor seven, and we're just chilling here for a minute, like, no, we're going somewhere, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, and I think that's the biggest thing, just really stressing the importance of, of movement and destination, and then, you know, just adding adding the, the bells and whistles to it. So that's spot on, you know. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I always think about that as a horn player too. Like, I remember having a conversation with, um, well, our mutual friend, uh, Darren Jackson, uh, who is 
uh, talking to me once about the tune and I, you know, I, I mentioned the tune. He's like, which one was that? And I, he was, and he, I remember hearing him remembering it through the chord changes because that's how he generally experiences tunes. And it, and, you know, as a more of a melodic instrument, I was hearing it through the melody and remembering it through the melody and that, you know, if that's the only sort of framework you have that it's limiting like on either end, whether you're, you know, but as horn players, we tend to approach it from this monolithic one way, melody, melody, melody. And, you know, you see so many students are like, do you know this tune? And they're like, yeah, I know the song. And then they start playing it. And as soon as they get past the melody, it's clear that they, you know, don't really even know what key the song was in, you know? So having that approach of like, of, of making sh sure that you, you think like a bass player, you know, Pops being a piano player, you know, but thinking, put, putting yourself in the mindset of those other instruments to know the same, all of the same information that you would need to know whether you were a bass player, a drummer, a piano player, or, you know, or a horn player. Absolutely, yeah. And big shout out to Pops, we love Pops. Um, it's yeah it's just a really great way to just kind of like it's like shaking off the cobwebs you know of any of these like harmonic nooks and crannies because i feel like it's really easy to get into habits whether it's the way that you play on a 251 or whether it's the way that you seem to play every time you get to the four chord on a blues you know we all have our own little habits which can be good and which can be bad. Um, and I think, you know, the idea is that we want to be able to be spontaneous. We want to really be improvising. We want to really be creating um, in the moment. And a lot of times for me, I almost feel a little bit freer when I know I have a really clear understanding of the structure under, underneath me. So it's, it's the practicing of the bass lines. It's the practicing of the arpeggios. It's the outlining of the bebop scales. It's the practicing the different extensions on every chord. And that's like, you know, the behind the scenes kind of like gathering up all my tools in the toolkit. And then when I get out there on the bandstand and I hear like the soundscape around me, you know, the bassist is playing the roots and, or, you know, roots and whatever. And the piano player's outlining the chords. It's like, it's all there. And then I can kind of choose like what to do. Um, so I guess the the baseline that I just demonstrated was was somewhat like advanced, I guess, in the in the way that I practice. Honestly, once I do the roots and the rhythms exercise, I'll just go to like improvise a kind of a two feel feel. So um, maybe just working even with just roots and fifths. <laughs> like closer um, from the roots and the rhythms. And then a really, you know, as we're listening to all these classic bassists, whether it's, you know, Mill Tinton, Paul Chambers, just anybody that, that we could be listening to, the classic uh, bass sort of approach is exactly what Carlos was mentioning, destination. So a lot of times a, a bassist will approach this destination note by a half step below or a half step above. So an example might be. more quarter notes as opposed to half notes because within the half note that I was doing before in those two beats now I'm kind of stating a note and then I'm picking out a tension note to land on my next destination so that might be um you know beat one might be at that stable note like a root and beat two is sort of like my tension or my motion note to land on beat three 
Um, and same thing with four to one, beats four to one, you're kind of having a little bit of tension and a release to get to your destination. So that's really good practice. Um, and then of course, when we get into thinking about Ray Brown, how can we not use triplets? Okay, and that's just one example. Um, many different ways to do it. You could do descending triplets, you can try ascending triplets, you can try just kind of little chromatic triplets, just anything that gets you, again, like Carlos said, to your uh, destination. So, and then from there, I'll just really try to, I'm like, okay, I got those kind of approaches under my belt, and I will just try to play as fluidly as I can, acting as a basis, but almost soloistically. So, uh, back to that B flat blues, you know, you might, you might start creating shapes for yourself, like in measure one and then measure two back to, so I'm going to kind of take that shape through a chorus here. a little bit more. I'm adding some more eighth note lines and it's almost as if I'm improvising just sort of like a broken two feel solo. Um, so those are some ideas that get us from where we started, which was just the roots, to now playing something that feels like it could actually be a cohesive solo on, on the bandstand. Um, and that's a really great exercise. Even if you understand the movement of the blues, um, I guarantee you there are some keys that, you know, this will feel maybe a little bit awkward in and in terms of the tension and release and getting to the destinations and finding some of those points that you want to land on and different paths to get there. Um, it's like a, it's just a whole world. There are no, there's no one way to do it. There are no right answers. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like my baseline spiel, if that resonates with anybody. So I, I do have a quick question for you. Okay. So in, I guess, in practicing these bass lines, I know like uh, one of one of my one of my mentors, who uh, the late great Willie Akins, uh, huge shout out to Willie Akins. Uh, but I remember when I was taking a lesson from him, and this is of course pre pre COVID, right? This, this is so crazy that we that we say pre COVID, so not BC but PC now, so it's pre COVID. This is so crazy, but. <laughs> Uh, right. This is crazy. But he was saying that, you know, he said you want to be able to, he said like, so if I'm, if I'm listening to you play, I want to be able to, like, if, if we just took out the basses, if we took out the drums, if we took out all chordal instruments, I want to be able to hear the changes within your playing. And I, and for me, um, one of one of the ways that I I've learned to practice, you know, practice bass lines is just kind of like, of course, practicing with a metronome, and this is something that I always stress to my kiddos. So if you're watching, yes, metronome, 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 metronome. But <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to know how do you go about practicing uh, practicing bass lines? I mean, besides just kind of like, well, yeah, or forming bass lines rather. Seeing it that it's not a, 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 a one size fits all kind of approach with bass lines, how do you go about shedding it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think doing it with a metronome is great because then you're still responsible for the, for the harmony as opposed to like playing along with a backing track or something where the harmony is kind of there for you already and the time is really there for you already too. Um, so with the metronome, you have to be a little bit like more responsible on both counts. I also will just kind of practice them solo. Um, and I think like, for example, that that shape that I took in as, as an example, do, 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 do. I'll just mess with different shapes like that. Um, it could be, or it could be, 
Or it could be. Or it could be. Right. So just picking sort of different motives to guide the line, different shapes. Um, and then that helps me to find different destinations. So then like from each of those little paths, you can, you could create like a full fledged solo. So I was just like trying to keep like the half step approach going and some triplets going. Um, and that's like one level beyond what feels like, you know, a baseline demonstration from that. So I'll give myself different themes, I guess. Along similar lines, Alexa, is there, is, have you spent any or much time transcribing or learning base like bass lines even just to get the ideas of some of those shapes? That's a great um, question. I have I haven't like written down uh, like like literally transcribed an entire bass solo, I don't think, but I've definitely like listened to records with the intention of listening to only the bassist, you know, for a pass and then listening, you know, maybe to the pianist for a pass. Um, so I'm really interested in like the counterpoint factor. Um, once you, like, once you bring in the melody, um, there has to be this like laser like awareness on behalf of the bassist to kind of navigate where you hear the, the horn player or the soloist going to make the harmony really full and kind of complete. Because if you're just both ending up on roots all the time, you're not really getting the quality of the chord, the like the lush, full sound of the harmonies. And so I think it's really interesting to listen to what the bassists are doing behind these horn players as a horn player ascends in their range. You know, oftentimes the bassist will descend and, and vice versa. Um, or if you start to hear a horn player imply a certain interval, like six, or sevenths or perhaps fourths and fifths and playing a little bit more maybe, maybe modally, you'll, you'll hear the bassist either switch to a pedal or perhaps he or she will start playing wider lines. You know, maybe just to get to go with that. Um, and so I think that's, it's, it's interesting because the bassist sort of like has this responsibility of improvising all the time improvising these baselines but they have to be like tasteful enough and like crafted to what else is going on so it's like a double responsibility like you're kind of soloing but you're like it's not about you the whole time you're trying to make other people sound good whereas if you're a saxophonist and you're waiting in line at 3 a.m for a Cherokee thing you know Cherokee jam session you're going up there and you're like oh yeah like how fast can I play like you don't care either I mean there that's what that happens and that's like the stereotypical, you're just like, you know, shred, shred, shred. And you're not necessarily thinking about like what the bassist is doing. So I don't know. I feel like the bassist is the underdog, you know, and I'm just trying to like give him some love. <laughs> I, I think you'll definitely that. have some bass players out there agreeing with you on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so funny. Um, Especially those that were... I was going to say, especially those that were playing bass at 3 a.m. on that Cherokee for those 20 Ooh. saxophone players. Exactly. Oh exactly. Oh, my God. I would hate yeah. that bass player. I would leave. I was like, all right, I'm going to go home now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you can walk the bass line. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, that's kind of my... Baseline. Yeah. Okay, so on to two five one talk, perhaps. Um, you know, this is the most prominent chord progression in jazz and probably Western American music, right? The the five to the one, um, and this is something that we, I think, as jazz educators, want all of our students to be able to 
play in any key. Um, and there are so many different ways to approach them. And I feel like this is kind of the platform for developing your bebop vocabulary specifically. I mean, your harmonic vocabulary for sure, but in generally 251s are a really great place to get the really di digest and try to try out all the stuff for, the, for bebop vocabulary. So if we take, let's, you know, take that blues that I was playing and just zoom in on the last four bars, which was the 251. So it's a two five one in B flat, C minor seven, F seven, B flat seven, G seven, A uh, C minor seven, F seven, and then um, so what I'll do is I'll you know mess around with bass lines on that, mess around with shapes, mess around with all of it, and I always want to make sure that I'm able to play all the permutations of the arpeggios. So starting with one three five seven. <laughs> And so I guess on the blues, um, I'm just going to, so I'm going to play these two five ones now, um, you know, in a blues, typically we're res resolving to a dominant chord, but let's, you know, we're going to kind of step away from that. So I'm, I'm. <laughs> So I'm going to resolve as if this is just a major two five one. Um, and so we can actually just even remove the six two five at the end and just go. Okay, so that's where we are. So two five one one. And so that was one three five seven. I'll I'll quiz myself. Um, Right, so uh, what is that? Five, seven, three, one. Right, so just quiz myself to pick out different permutations and try to do them on the spot. Again, if B flat is feeling comfortable for you, go to B um, or go to D flat or whatever key. So, and then, you know, once I get comfortable with all those arpeggios, um, I'm, I'm kind of comfortable to move on to the bebop scale. So I might try to implement a line like this. And so I'm using that bebop scale on the dominant seven chord, the five chord. Three, two, one, major seven, dominant seven. So I'm really trying to bring out and emphasize that sound. And again, that's an item of tension resolving to the major chord. Um, so in that first measure, I was just outlining the minor seven chord. I just went down it and up it. And then I did some voice leading and I just took this tiny bit of my dominant seven B buff scale, which are so great to practice if you're feeling like you're bored with your major scales. <laughs> Right, just practicing those descending around the circle of fourths is a really great way for horn players to get your bebop articulation warmed up in the morning um, and also just to kind of maintain agility in those in those keys. But that's like the quintessential bebop sound. And of course, um, for anybody that's really like looking to get into scales, there's also a major bebop scale um, where the chromatic half step occurs between scale degrees five and six, as opposed to seven and one, where we just experienced it. Um, and so that's another scale you can practice too. But for now, I'm just talking about really emphasizing that bebop sound on the five chord. So if I wanna embellish that, um, there are so many ways that I can take that little line. And if anybody at home is like sitting with their horn, feel free to you know mute yourself and, and pick that up off the cuff by ear. Um, but I'm going to now use some approach notes in the in the two chord to, and then I'm going to add some embellishments on the five chord, just some turns, like some little turns. Um, and then I'm going to add a little bit of bebop language on the major chord. So you're, this is going to sort of feel like an intermediate <clears throat> level. <laughs> So on that 
two chord, I just approached by a half step in the beginning. And I also just adjusted the rhythm a little bit. And then on my five chord, added some turns, added some chromaticism. And on my one chord, I added some sort of standard diatonic bebop vocabulary there. Um, so it's kind of like in, in language, we have prefixes, we have, you know, verbs, we have nouns, we have adjectives, we have suffixes. And so I'm kind of thinking of like the two chord as the prefix and the five chord as sort of like the meat of my sentence and then the one chord as the suffix. So there are many, many, many things you could do. And so now to, to make it a little bit more um, advanced, I might, um, let's see. So I added a little bit more half step approach notes in the two chord. Um, I ended up adding some alterations on the five chord. I kept that bebop sound, but I added a flat nine and a sharp nine. And then in the on the one chord, I continued with that sort of bebop vocabulary, but with a little chromaticism. And then I emphasized the, the six or the 13, which is sort of a new color there. Um, so that's like three levels of, of one thing. And so wherever, you know, if somebody's anybody's watching and they're like, oh yeah, that level feels right for me, or I feel like I'm at the earlier level or whatever. Um, all you have to do, I guess what I'm show, trying to show is that these small, really, really small changes can help get you to the next level just by having an understanding of the fundamental element of tension and release. Um, the five chord being that you can really provide that larger moment of tension to release to the one chord. And then I was even adding some moments of tension and release on the two chord when I had those approach notes. Right? And that's just my arpeggio, but I'm approaching it by each of those notes by a half step below every time. And so that's something that if you are the person that is working on your arpeggios, your next challenge will be to work on getting the approach notes to your arpeggios. And then that's, that's really fun. So I just played through the whole two, five, one sequence, just getting those approach notes nice and clear. Um, yeah. How about you guys, Andy and Carlos? Is that, I mean, how do you deal with trying to either, um, gain clarity on two fives or try new things or tension and release? What are your thoughts? Uh, I, I usually go back a lot to, uh, I, I usually go back to recordings, you know, just the, the, the cast that I did, of course, Cannonball. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm always checking out, you know, just trying to see how he's approaching it. And then I'll go back and I'll stop the recording, you know, Versus like just trying to rip it. All right, let me rip it. Let me do what Cannonball did. And it's like, uh, okay, cool. We we already heard what Cannonball is doing. So from that point, I'll just try different patterns. You know what I mean? So uh, just so I have that more right here. For example. Oh yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> So for example, I'll just try, I'll take a, uh, maybe I'll just take a simple two, five, one. Right, and I'll just go in different keys or. And so on and so forth. So I'll just try to take it in, in, in patterns or, or just 12 keys just to get comfortable with it. And I think something that you touched on is like super, like it was like right on time. I, I was telling my uh, students, I think last week, I told them that uh, I hit a, I kind of hit a brick wall. You know, I think everybody sort of hit a brick wall during this quarantine. And uh, everybody's just kind of like, I, I had to ask myself this question, like, why am I 
why am I shedding on two fives or why am I doing this? Or, and, and one thing that I, I found myself going back to a lot was the, the fundamentals, right? And it was very refreshing. And I had to remind myself the reason why I'm practicing all these techniques and two five ones and three six two five and all this other good stuff is because I want to be able to communicate freely, right? And so something that you mentioned, which was so cool, uh, you, you mentioned how you look at the uh, the two chord is kind of like the prefix and then the, the five is kind of like the suffix. And I was like, well, not the suffix, but you know, just kind of like the meat and potatoes of what you got going on. And that, that's kind of like how I, I try to approach it. So I want to be able to, let's just say if I want to, if I'm playing a blues and I want to say, something like that versus you know I, I want to be able to to speak freely so just as so just as uh clear as i can say hey everyone my name is carlos brown my favorite color is orange uh oh man i love pizza by the way pepperoni's like my thing i want to be able to do that like with my horn so I, I would take it in 12 keys and then I would also kind of like add some add some different rhythms like you know just some shahoolas like I love a, a I love a good shahoola uh, my, my dad's a, <laughs> my dad's a trumpeter and uh, I would he would he would play Clifford Brown a lot so like just a lot of like shahoolas and rhythmic stuff just to, just to kind of like dance around and make it more more interesting and fun so that's kind of like my approach and then uh, whenever I'm whenever I I, I would never say run out of ideas because I, I don't think you can ever run out of ideas. I think I think as a as a as a musician, I think it's very important that we continue to use our imagination. You know what I mean? So I'm I'm, I'm I always tell my my kiddos like if you can think it, it's crazy it's it's crazy as it may seem you can do it like because it, it's there. You know what I mean? So that's just something that I like to do. So I love that. I was, I was thinking about when you were talking to Alexa, I mean, I know, I think I'm similar to Carlos as far as like trying to take, you know, if I'm looking for something new or something, it's always like going to a recording and trying to like parse things out from there. You know, what is, uh, you know, what did Cannonball or, you know, if it's, if I'm really in a rut, like what is somebody I've never really gotten into in that way, or maybe that sounds completely differently do and and you know really trying to get to that point of of trying to understand something they play beyond you know okay here's a two five one lick all 12 keys and i'm going to cut and paste it into here but like you know you know you talked about a number of things a, a certain language and bebop certain you know approach tones things like that that are all things that i think I, you know, a lot of times I've come to those through, uh, a, you know, listening to somebody or transcribing and, you know, for anybody that's listening, when I say transcribing, I think probably for most of us, I mean, not necessarily like Alexa said earlier, writing it down, but just trying to internalize it and learn to play it. Um, I keep saying over and over, we need a better word in jazz that's related specifically to, um, to this concept but you know that you know or, or if it's like uh i've talked about on a live stream we did a cannonball lick that you know where it's like it's a it's a pattern that he plays that you get to it and it's like oh that's really a diminished scale that he's playing a pattern over you know and so like just that understanding opens up you know so much that you can do with that beyond just this one lick even if you even once you learn it in all 12 keys and can utilize it you know that like oh i can play a certain pattern over diminished sound and you know where does he come out on the end of it you know like again you were talking about earlier and i was curious alexa too like you know so for you in your process you're talking about moving from one level sort of to the next as far as your harmonic concept and the language that you're using you know using approach tones using different things like where do you necessarily draw like an inspiration or pull ideas to to take that next step that's a great question so yeah i will do this exercise like even just with lines that i find myself playing 
regularly. So like, um, one, one line that I, even, even just the, I can, I, you know, can easily kind of do that a lot. Cause sometimes it feels really good to just like place that right in the pocket or whatever, whatever, like with the, with, with all the, you know, the fun turns and all that stuff. But sometimes it just feels good to kind of put that right there in the pocket. Um, but I will try to challenge myself to come up with different versions. So this is like this whole thing that I'm talking about is kind of like a play on that, on that exercise. Like basically just trying to not get myself, I don't want to ever sort of be regurgitating or repeating myself or, you know, and I think, you know, it's just as you said, Andy, you're like, oh yeah, he or she is using the diminished scale. Um, I want to like be able to use the diminished scale 100 different ways and not have somebody say like, oh, there's that diminished lick again, you know? And so for me, sometimes I feel like I have like a handful of sort of patterns or licks that I gravitate to towards, but even just changing either the octave or the interval or the permutation or the uh, placement in the measure of some of those patterns can create a whole different effect. And so it's sort of like, like when you come home and you try to make dinner and you don't have that much, but like you end up come, like scratching something together with what you've got, you know? Um, and so it's sort of like, we can take what we already are using and come up with like five sort of offshoots of each of the things that I find I normally do. So like, if I have, I mean, I don't know if I really subscribe to the fact that you have like a certain amount of stock licks, but say I have like three lines that I kind of generally gravitate towards. If I can spend some time in the shed and, and even just set my timer for 15 minutes and take that one lick and really kind of like do it ad, ad nauseum, but doing something different with it every time, I feel like I'm gonna kind of like shake it out of my system. Like I'm gonna shake the original version of it out of my system. And I'm just going to have sort of the bones of it um, and have like 100 different approaches to just like the theme of that lick, if that makes sense. So it's sort of trying to shake it up, trying not to get stale. Um, and I so that's actually what I'll do, like to get new things. And like the inspiration is, you know, mess with intervals, mess with octaves, mess with directions of things, reverse things, flip things. Um approach something by this, by a half step now above by a half step, whatever. And then I'll also, of course, you know, listen, I love like Kenny Garrett. I love Dick Oates. I love Joe Henderson. I love Phil Woods. I love Cannibal. So, you know, any listening to anything that they're doing um, and just even remembering some type of little thing that they do or whatever will kind of spur a new path. Yeah, I've been thinking more and more about as we listen and 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 learn from recordings like that, that, like you sort of work from big picture to small picture, which, you know, like I learned this, this solo, this whole chorus, I learned this lick and learned how to apply it. I learned that, you know, this musician was approaching this change or, you know, with a certain thought right in this little moment, you know, those little patterns that um, you can see even when you study somebody over a number of solos or if you're focusing on two five ones taking five blue solos from somebody and just focusing on the way they play that turnaround each time yeah. you know and get 20 passes of it and and oh there you know you can kind of even get into like a higher level thinking of like they're hearing this certain harmonic thing and moving in this certain way that is, you know, again, this like real minutia instead of like, oh, here's a lick or they, you know, play this exact thing. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's both sides of it. Right. Like, is it, you know, is it more, is it more important for somebody in the moment to be looking at the big picture or looking kind of at the, at those details. And I feel like transcribing a solo is the big, is kind of the best way for me at least to get that big picture. Like really just listening to that solo all the time, digging in, really playing along to get the tone color, the effects, the articulation. That's like, those are the big picture elements. And then I think this really specific minutia, as you said, um, 
helps me just in terms of like getting out of my own head, trying to, it's like, it's like practicing being spontaneous, I guess. Um, you know, taking a lick and then coming up with like, just trying, forcing myself to come up with 20 different versions of it. Um, yeah, practicing being spontaneous because I guess like that's what we're trying to do on the bandstand and how can you get up and do it if you've never, it's like an, if it's a muscle that you haven't worked before, I guess. Um, I wonder if we have any, oh, sorry, sorry, Carlos, go ahead. Oh, no, 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 you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, do we have any anybody watching with us live? Any comments or anything? I was just going to say that, ask if there were any questions from folks. Um, yeah, cause we got about 10 minutes left. So if if you are listening and you have something you want clarity on or just a question in general for, or I guess any of us, but especially Alexis, since she's with us, um, please leave those here. Awesome. So maybe I can share my screen, Andy. Um, I'll just absolutely kind of tell the people what I've been up to. So I'm I'm working on. Well, I'm I'm. This is I'm working on in this in the new year launching sort of like a, a membership platform with all of my sort of educational thoughts and exercises and all that stuff. And as part of that, I've been working on um, just looking at my exercises and my thoughts and what I'm practicing and what I feel like I want my students to know and what they feel like they want to know and all that stuff. And so this idea of how do I get good vocabulary fast seems to be like what everybody wants right now. And the, the real answer is that there is no magic potion. There's no fairy dust. But uh, I guess this idea of distilling it into sort of like three ideas, you know, uh, a basic structure embellishing a little bit and then really embellishing it. That was sort of how I wanted to distill the idea of how you could get to that type of complex bebop vocabulary that you might hear people playing um, and want to cop. So I've been posting these videos called Express Jazz Vocab on my Instagram. And uh, basically I play the lick and then I have a, a, um, PDF to match. So I'm just going to share my screen. This is the E flat PDF. And okay, here we go. So, and I've been doing two of them a week, two of the videos a week on Instagram. And so, um, and then people can tag um, and, and share, you know, their practice sessions, because I really feel like I kind of want, I feel like everybody's always posting their finished products on Instagram and I'm like trying to encourage more like posting the dirty work. Um, and so I feel like this is an example kind of of my dirty work, like breaking it down. Like these beginner licks that you see, these are things that I, you know, practice that I find important. And I feel like a lot of students might think that, you know, we're really practicing only advanced stuff all the time, but it's just not the case. So here's an example of what, you know, of just one of those. Um, and then this one was, and I, and I try to give an idea of the themes that I just came up with. Um, so again, I'm like working on that bebop scale here and some chromatic approach notes. And then this one was like very much, it looks scarier than it is, but that was like an advanced one. Um, so yeah, if anybody, I have them up for, uh, these two are up for free downloads on my website. And I think I gave Andy the link. Um, if you wanna throw it up to anybody that wants it, you can go on and download those. If, if anybody's feeling inspired from the vocab that we talked about today. Yeah, and that's, that's up in the comments uh, now on Thanks. Facebook. So you see that and where can, uh, what is your Instagram? Oh, it's just my name, Alexa Tarantino. And my website is the same, alexatarantino.com. So, um, but that's, yeah, they got the, that link that just goes to the free download page of my website. So yeah, I'm going to keep putting those up. Um, I think this week they'll also be up as free downloads and yeah, just trying to like sort of demystify the process and encourage people to share their work as opposed to like, you know, the final product all the time. Cause I think with everybody being in quarantine for eight months and seeing everybody's like 
only their like life highlights, you know, it can get a little crazy. It's like good to see the process. I think that's super important. And I'm glad you, I, I'm glad you uh, brought that up because I, I know that students now are there every, I think with everything being so instant, you know, and everything is just like, oh, okay, cool. Like the touch of a button, I could be talking to somebody from the UK or, you know, somebody from Africa or wherever, you know what I mean? And I, and I think we, I think we often uh, forget, and myself included, definitely myself included, I'm definitely bridging myself, <laughs> but we often forget how, um, how cool it is to just kind of like sit down and experiment with some stuff, you know, and if, you know, I, I don't know, like, let's just say if, if, if you were successful at it, it's not the end of the world, you know what I mean? It's just music, nobody gets hurt, right? Right. So I was I was shedding on, oh my God, I was shedding on uh, Moments Notice a few weeks back. And I haven't played it since high school. And I was like, yo, I was like, I was so frustrated. I was like, yo, what's happening? I was like, oh, whoop, no, 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 no. First, I haven't played it in years. Secondly, let me just slow everything down. And, and I and I think that's something that's, that really, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you really said that again, because it's, it's something that, you know, we kind of forget to cherish. Cause I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of fun being in the, for me at least, cause I'm, I'm a nerd. So, I mean, I love being in the shade and just kind of like seeing what fits and then what doesn't fit, you know, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think like the funny thing is I, I'm also guilty of the instant gratification thing. And what I guess the, the thing I was just thinking about was like, I'm curious if anybody like downloads, like I'm always downloading these things that people put up, like my 10 favorite books or like, you know, the best recipes for the holidays or whatever. I'm like always like downloading them. And then how often do I actually read them? Like downloading them doesn't mean that I actually like have the information. Like I am a phone, (laughs) you know, like, oh yeah, I downloaded it. Like, so it's, I know it. It's like, no, I have to actually open it and like sit through and read it. And so that's the crazy thing. Cause it's, it's not like when we used to go to the music store and pick up a method book, you know? And it's like, so we have all these resources. I probably have like hundreds of these, you know, downloads like from friends or whatever, your PDF resources and all that stuff. And so I guess I would um, just encourage people. Yeah. To, to open it up and um, yeah. Spend a few minutes in the shed. Don't be afraid. Yeah. I, th- I talk about that all the time. That idea of like, there's so much out there that, you can't, you're so overwhelmed with it. You can't get one thing done. And that it's like, Oh no, you got, you know, and, and there is a difference between, you know, I think even when some of us were, were definitely when I was uh, a kid, you know, like there was a limited number of things you had access to. And so you only listen to that one record for a while. You only worked in out of that one method book. You only, you know, met with that one teacher, you know, even that, like, you know, I see, you see people who are like, we get students all the time that are like, or who do you study with? Well, I took a lesson with, you know, Alexa Tarantino and Chad left with Brown and, you know, and it's like, you're getting a lot of great stuff, but how deep are you going with each one of those? Or are you just like, right. are you just downloading that one PDF? You know, it's that same kind of thing. Are you just downloading that one PDF and never really working on it? Exactly. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So I feel like um, the other thing that I would just want to say is, uh, you know, I, a lot of this approach that I'm that I was just talking about with you guys is like, like I mentioned, very sort of like inward looking. And so um, if it feels like too much for anybody, or you're like, I don't know where to start. Always just playing along with a record, just I feel like for me, kind of jump starts the inspiration, jump starts the energy, jump starts the, the desire to learn more and figure it out. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, you know, that's the real root of it. At the, you know, this is just a way to try to help people, but by no means is this like the be all end all. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, I think we're just about out of time. Uh, I, I don't really have any questions from anybody right now, but if you're watching this later, uh, if you're, we've posted that, you know, this will be 
available on Facebook or in maybe some other platforms at some point, you know, always feel free to leave questions. We can pass things along or, or answer, you know, get them answered for you. So even if you're not live, um, but before we go, I want to thank Carlos and, and definitely want to thank Alexa for being with us today. Mm -hmm.